Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're located. And welcome to the webinar for HD Radio Innovation from Nautel. Um, this, this webinar is a little different than we've had in the past in the sense that it's, it's presenting concepts um, that are it's the concept car as opposed to uh, mature technology ready to implement. We take no responsibility for application, but we, we just think it's pretty cool. So with that in mind, these are the things that we're going to do today, and, and we is me and Philip Schmidt, the, the uh, grandfather or the father of a lot of the cool technology that comes out of Nautel, including HD Power Boost, including the, um, uh, the uh, uh, high reliability protocol, and also, um, it's also, he's also the father of HD Multiplex. Welcome, Phil. Yes, hello, everybody. Glad to have you on board today. So, what things we're going to talk about? We're going to kind of do a brief overview of HD radio in general, uh, where it's at in the in the marketplace, the the technical considerations, the signal review, and then talk about the fourth IBOC broadcast equipment architecture that exists now in the marketplace. Then we're going to get into HD Power Boost uh, Gen 4, and uh, we're going to contrast that a little bit against Par 1, the original implementation of of the uh, peak to average power reduction algorithm included in the ubiquity system part two which is the uh, second release of that uh, located in the gen 4 um, uh, H uh, ubiquity release and um, and then contrast that against the HD power boost which of course is the Nautel uh, implementation and then we're going to talk we're going to go right out into never never land and talk about HD multiplex uh, and what's possible what if you're dreaming what's possible and then talk about the economic benefits and the application areas so uh, as always there's an opportunity for you to ask questions the uh, go to webinar system has a, a place for you to ask questions on the right hand side you can ask them at any time we'll answer them at the end of the webinar to the best of our ability if we don't happen to get to your questions we will be able to send you emails and answer your questions by email offline do remember that if you're involved in SBE and 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 recognize the value of certification that the uh, completion of a Nautel webinar does qualify for a half of an SBE recertification credit under the current SBE rules, and we're very proud of that. All right, so where are we today? Uh, HD Radio currently has about 28 million receivers in the marketplace. That makes it by far the uh, most uh, successful digital radio implementation around the world. In, in total, there's 2,087 HD radio stations on the air and a total of 3,708 total channels, of which 1,735 of them are multicast channels. There's even four, 47 channels running HD4. Note here the distribution. So most of all stations, <clears throat> as you can see here, uh, do have HD2, and then a declining number have 2, 3, and 4. Um, and then if you add all of that up, you can see that the secondary stations, the stations you can only hear with an HD radio, um, is, um, is very high. It's over 1,600 stations right now just in the United States alone. So, Phil, why don't you tell us where the, the basics of the hybrid IPOC signal? Right. So what we're looking at here is essentially the uh, a spectral view of the FM and the IBOC carriers on the side. So the FM signal in the, in the center, as we're all familiar with. And we have two sidebands, one to the lower and one to the upper side. In a basic uh, service mode MP1, each one of those um, sidebands is about 63 kilohertz. Those 63 kilohertz are made up each of 10 frequency partitions. Uh, and each partition has 18 data carriers and one reference carrier. So the reference carrier is used to lock onto the signal, whereas then the data carries the actual audio and data information. So in total, it makes 382 across the two because there's one additional set of reference carriers at the end. If you look at each individual carrier, they're all QPSK modulated for the FM uh, standard, which means that... Um, they have all constant amplitude, as shown in this graph here, um, more or less constant amplitude. Uh, but they all have different phase information. Uh, so there's four points in terms of phase for each carrier. 
which means it can, they can carry two bits of information uh, for each carrier. And I've also marked the reference carriers here in red. And you can see they, they toggle back and forth between this and this point here. And they try to maintain very good phase information. Um, and that's, that's how the receiver locks on. Now, of course, we always want more data. Um, so there is another commonly used service mode, MP3, not to be confused with MP3 audio. It is a service mode that ad adds two more frequency partitions towards the inside of those carriers. Uh, that gives us another 24.8 kilobits per second for a total of about 123. And now our side carrier, sideband, uh, have increased to about 84 kilohertz. And um, there's yet another service mode where we can add yet another 20% of carriers, uh, another two frequency partitions at the end, filling out entire 100 kilohertz. Uh, that's service mode MP11. Uh, however, this service mode is not officially um, accepted at this point, but it certainly could be in the future. That would then give us 148 kilobits per second. And it would have a lot of capacity for a lot of audio. But there'd be a trade-off in terms of interaction with the analog. Yes, exactly. So at this point, we would expect you might have to uh, reduce your uh, deviations just slightly. Uh, there might be um, SCA interference issues, whatnot. MP3 is still okay, but MP11 would probably have, we'd have to have a serious look at the FM itself. Right. Now, there's also what uh, is are termed all digital service modes. Uh, we're looking at MP5 here. Uh, MP5 uses the entire 100 kilohertz, just like MP11, but the FM has been turned off. And if a receiver detects that it's listening to a, a MP5 service mode, it will squelch the FM as soon as it knows, or, the, or what, it, what could be the FM, which is now just noise. It will squelch it and then blend in the analog when the analog, uh, the digital audio when it's there. So with that, we also have about 123 kilobits broken up in three different streams, um, but we have a lot more robustness in the signal description. Another alternative is service mode MP6, which looks no different spectrally. It's got the same sideband definitions, same bandwidth, same everything, but the, the bit rate is actually reduced in favor of even further robustness. So that means that for the same power level that you're broadcasting, let's say, an, a set of MP11 carriers, MP6 would go much further. Uh, how far exactly? I We do not exactly know. Um, but there have been tests done on MP6, and the uh, uh, coverage has been fantastic. Now, there's also an all-digital IBOC definition that then fills the FM space with lower secondary carriers. Those are termed the MS modes, and that could give you yet another 140 kilobits, but you would only be able to receive these guys fairly close into the station because they are such low in level, and their relative robustness is, is fairly low as well, but at least space is made. So when you talk about uh, HD radio all digital IBOC mode, this is what they're referring to. Right, exactly. And okay. while, while the modes that we talked so far, 1, 3, 11, 5, and 6, they're all supported today and they're all in basic receiver chipsets. Well, those MS modes have not been implemented yet. Uh, okay. The broadcast chain nor in the receiver. So they're really not, the, the current system that IBOC has rolled out doesn't make use of all the bandwidth that's available within the in an all digital mode. Exactly. So that's why it makes it interesting when we get into the later part of the presentation where we present an option that can work with today's receivers. Right. Now, one question that's always asked is, uh, you know, how much bit rate do I need for my audio to sound good? And there have been perceptual audio studies done. Um, this one goes back to 2004 by Dr. Alan Sheffield, for example. And uh, what you find here when people are asked to rate the audio uh, as you decrease the bit rate, generally what we find is that most people are unable to really perceive the difference between 48 kilobits, 56 kilobits. Um, once you get be up beyond 48, the differences are not really perceptible. So one thing that's important to understand here is that when we talk about a, a, a bit rate of 48 kilobits and the frame of reference that many people have is MP3 audio quality where 256 kilobits is, is considered to be good audio quality. Um, this is a, the high, HD codec is a very advanced codec similar to, what would you say it's similar to? 
Well, it's similar to AAC in many respects. It, it's, it, it is a uh, um, perceptual codec. Um, it is not a lossless codec like some, some other options out there. Uh, but compared to MP3, it is a lot more efficient. And the other. And it includes spectral band replication too, right? It does, yeah, exactly. Yep. Okay. Um, so with in normal typical stereo mode, you know, we can get down to 36 kilobits or even 32 before we really start to see a big difference. Um, but this codec also has an option that's termed parametric stereo, uh, which is a lot more bandwidth efficient. And unlike stereo, which has a full two sets of uh, streams, audio streams for left and right, uh, parametric stereo is essentially a single stream with steering information for left and right. So Mono with steering. Pardon? Mono with steering. Yes, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And it really does feel like stereo. Um, when you switch back to a true stereo, you can hear differences, but if you just listen to that, it, it, it sounds like stereo. Okay. Um, and of course, if, and at this set point here, I mean, we can kind of compare that to today's, you know, it's, it's very subjective, of course, uh, but you could actually get down to uh, FM uh, comparable quality with 24 kilobits and parametric stereo. Uh, if you if you're let's say an AM station used to mono and you, your program is in fact mono, well now we can even push this down to let's say 16 kilobits or so. Okay, so if we had to compare, we would say 48 kilobits is substantially better than FM today. 36 kilobits is is um, is actually better than uh, FM today. 24 kilobits is similar to FM today, and and 16 kilobits would be similar to AM today, is that right? Yes, exactly. I mean, with FM, it's always, the, if you have very good signal, um, you, you can get a very good uh, uh, sure. signal out of it. But when you take into account fading and um, um, uh, and uh, multipath and all that, in a typical environment, there is degradation. Right, okay. So one key aspect of all that, of course, is that in order to get good audio quality at those low bit rates, you really have to have a hard look at good audio processing and preconditioning. And this study was done back in 2004, and the industry has come a long ways in, uh, in making uh, codec audio sound a lot better today. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would imagine that, you know, with the proper attention given to it, you can make all the sound very good. Let's just have a quick look at, now we've looked at the signal, let's look at the components needed to make all of this work, just to give a little bit of background information here. And of course, on, on the left-hand side is essentially your studio plant with, uh, you know, play out automation, any of the data service providers, you know, it's just a big bubble here. But all of the secondary services and data services go in, in what is called the importer. And the audio clients in the importer do the HD codec compression and we'll send all the compressed audio which now occupies a fairly low bandwidth over the i2e link to the exporter. The exporter also takes the HD1 audio and compresses that using the HDC encoder and uh, multiplexes the entire data capacity and sends it over to the XGen. The synchronizer which in our exporter plus implementation is a single box uh, make sure that this transmission happens synchronously with a true uh, 10 megahertz uh, GPS discipline 10 megahertz. Um, so at this level, we have HD 1, 2, and 3. Um, FM is still being sent over traditional STL means or whatever uh, means we choose. The E2X link, which now only occupies about 150 to 200 kilobits because it is the compressed audio, uh, is sent to the X-Gen, which creates the signal that we described so far. And the E to X link is where you would apply the reliable HD transport if you decided to utilize that. Exactly, exactly. Because we found a lot of these links, while they go up mountains, whatnot, um, are oftentimes in not the best of situations. High reliability cannot always be guaranteed. And reliable HD transport makes sure that if lost packets are in the stream, it will retransmit them and will smooth out the bandwidth requirements as well. So the XGen over here, its responsibility is to create the two sidebands. Um, and with that, um, Apicory also provides two algorithms called PAR1 and PAR2 that are intended to reduce the instantaneous signal peaks in the iBox signal to more reasonable levels. 
Um, and in the same token, we, an hotel has a, a very comparable, uh, but in our, uh, certainly as we can see, see later, a uh, better approach to the uh, to peak reduction is called HD Power Boost, which lives in an FPGA implementation inside the Exciter. So which one of these... We're going to examine that in detail on another slide. And which ones of these work better? Well, first, let's have just a, a brief look at HD Power Boost. If you're more interested in more detail, well, I've got a master's uh, report on that if you're really interested. Um, and uh, we certainly have more presentations on that topic as well. But just to recap, down here, we have our typical FM modulation with your normal analog feeds. FM has a constant envelope signal. Up here, we generate the digital IBOX signal. And in the standard um, implementation, peak reduction was done on this signal here. And you can see the peaks in the signal here. Almost looks like noise to some extent, um, but they're being done here. What we've noticed is, well, what if we switched where this block is done? Uh, not here, but we have to really look at the two signals because when you add them together, the peak distribution really changes. So if you consider both analog and digital signals together, well, we get up to 30% more power output, 7% uh, better efficiency, even, even better in some cases, as we shall see later. Um, and overall, it has been a very successful product. Uh, it's been in the market since 2010, and it's widely used. And it's now included in the GV series. Exactly. Yes, exactly. And the other thing that's included as well is you've got a couple of different configuration points. You can either go for high quality or, or high uh, power output, high efficiency implementation of the signal, or you can go for industry leading high quality signal. Um, in the middle here. So this, when we talk about quality, we're talking about MER or the accuracy of the signal as opposed to the audio performance. Exactly. And when we talk about going for more TPO, more, more efficiency, we're still meeting the ubiquity standard. Exactly. 14 dB is okay. the increased standard for MER. We're better than that, but we get 30% more power than comparable Power 1 here. At the same power level as Power 1, we get better quality. So in the end, Perfect. it works better. Uh, another very interesting feature we've introduced last year is the Spectrum Efficiency Optimizer, and it simply uh, looks at your, for, at your spectrum and ensures that you have given mass clearance, and it will automatically dial in the best efficiency that your transmitter can do. We can talk. The way I like to, the way I like to, to describe this is we've had spectrum analyzers in our transmitters before, but this is the first time the transmitter itself became self-aware and could take actions in terms of optimizing the parameters of the transmitter to, in order to maximize the efficiency and the performance. Right, and particularly with the previous modes that we discussed about, no matter what you dial your signal in, our transmitter will automatically figure out the best operating point. All right. Now let's have a look at okay. part two. Part two is very similar in concept to HD Power Boost. It looks at both the analog and digital signal together um, and uh, tries to do a, a more intelligent clipping process. Um, one thing that you'll find the first time you run the signal here, here's our FM carrier. Well, there's a bunch of noise coming out of the modulator. Uh, in this signal. This is not amplifier created noise, it is intentional modulator noise, and it helps to reduce peaks by 9 to 25%, depending on where you configure that level to be. That noise is under the MP3 carrier space, it's in where typically your spectral regrowth region would be, and um, even uh, you know, any, any room you can find under the mask. I've, I've played with the most optimal set point here, and I found at about 8 dB below mask, that's where we get the, uh, the, the best uh, performance. Another thing that- Part two, I should mention. Part two is the, part two is the, is the system that, that Ubiquity is releasing in the most current software release, and uh, that is used by our esteemed competitors. Yes, exactly. And now- okay. This new uh, software does require both the analog and a digital signal to go through the Ubiquiti software in order to do that. Um, one thing that we found is that when you first fire up Power 2 um, and you don't have any FM modulation on it, look at, looking at the screen curve here, it actually works quite well. Um, and what this plot here shows you is given a one kilowatt FM carrier, how often does the signal go beyond, beyond a two kilowatt set point, 2.6, 3.4? And this is the probability on the y axis here. 
So you can kind of see how peaky the signal is. And we found as we turn on 100% 1 kilohertz tone, it really swings out a lot. And that is the standard that we test to. That's a standard that we that drives our transmitter specifications. So 100 kilohertz, 100% 1, 1 kilohertz tone on the FM is what we need to spec our transmitters. By the same token, when we switch from MP1 to MP3 mode, you get 20% more carriers. That also causes the uh, peakiness of the signal or the, the, inst the instantaneous peaks to swing out by 9 to 17%, depending on where you look. Um, and that also has a, a significant performance penalty. Just like we've introduced the high quality mode and um, high efficiency mode before, now the PAR2 also provides an eyeball quality slider where you can dial in the amount of quality. We've had this years ago, uh, but now it, here it is as well. But it has a very significant impact on how well your signal performs. So when you put it all together and compare PAR2 versus power boost, uh, your red line here is sort of our reference line of the original PAR1. Um, and yes, PAR2 does give us some benefit, especially in these regions here. Um, but overall, you know, there's still some peaks that are fairly high, but the amplifier can't clip those without uh, much of a spectral um, regrowth issue. Um, but overall, you can see the drastic difference in how well power boost can control even intermittent peaks. And it'll so just for the uninitiated, having not seen a graph like that before, the further left the line is, the better it is. Yes, exactly. The, I mean, here you can see you'll you'll need you have peak powers of 3.3 kilowatts, and the other thing to note with that as well is your antenna system will have to handle those instantaneous peaks as well. If your amplifier does not clip those and lets them go through, and you have a very good spectrum that day, well, your antenna will still have to handle that peak. Overall, if you compare Power 2 versus Power Boost, we see much improvement. And we really have no reason to adopt Power 2. Um, HD Power Boost is still our preferred means and method. And why not? I mean, you can see the improvements. Exactly. Both in efficiency and total power capability. Right. But yep. now, now we're getting into sort of the cool aspect of it. Well, uh, we'll, we'll do the slide first. I forgot about this slide. Um, but what it also means, and it shows you a really nice effectiveness of HD Power Boost, is that your entry into HD has really lowered. Any GV transmitter you get today, even if you run at nameplate power, you can get minus 16 dBC eyeball carriers. Uh, that didn't used to be the case just a few years ago, where you had to significantly derate a transmitter to even minus 20. Um, and if you have 10% headroom, well, now you can dial in minus 14 dB, 35% headroom, you're all the way up to minus 10, which is the highest allowed level. Now, the cool thing with HD Power Boost, because, uh, you know, Nautala came up with it, we can extend it, we can play with it. So what we've done is uh, we've, we've um, essentially taken three signals, three independent X-Gens, exporters and importers with all of their audio feeds. We frequency shift once one signal and the frequency shift the other signal the other way. And we have one power boost algorithm that handles all of these carriers together and collectively reduces the peaks. Now what the signal will look like is something like this. Here we're looking at three stations. The first station essentially you could dial in, let's say at 97.9. The next one is at 98. And the next one is at 98.1. And all of these can be achieved with 100 kilohertz tuning. And overall, we take 600 kilohertz of bandwidth. Each one of these stations... Which isn't available in all, in all areas. Right, exactly. And we'll get to some of the 400 kilohertz modes in a little bit. Um, each one of these stations has 123 kilobits, gives us almost 370 in total. And that's enough for 15 audio streams, and that's what we've demonstrated at NAB this year, with 32, 24, and 16 kilobits. Um, and all of these sidebands levels, I've just for demonstration purposes, I just adjusted the levels just to show that we can do that. They could all be flat as well. Um, but this way, we could potentially mitigate uh, adjacent channel interference and whatnot. And uh, so I think it's a powerful tool. We can also switch MP3 into the all-digital MP5 mode, and now it has a real good purpose. Um, and as I said before, with MP5 tuning into a station like that, the receiver will first mute the FM, 
uh, which it's just no longer there, and it will play the uh, the audio once it's available. Uh, and unlike the MP3 mode, where it's first blending from the FM to the digital. Here's just a, a subset of receivers that we found uh, could work. Um, most receivers are capable to, to tune. Uh, some receivers do have to require uh, a, you know, a backdoor setting to switch it into a European mode potentially, or you know, they all handle it slightly different. But all receivers can tune in at least into two of those stations. Many receivers also have HD scan capability that can, can pick up your station, but some of them require an FM carrier in order to be picked up. Now, here are some of the cool things. Uh, once you put all of this together, the cost of transmission really goes down. So if you're looking at a GV today running, let's say, at 10 kilowatts at 100% of nameplate, you actually have 160% peak power capability. Now, you couldn't run a continuous wave at 160%, but IBOC peaks can go up to 160. So typically, when you run minus 10, well, you're, you have to drop your RMS level a little bit in order to make room for the peaks. But what is very nice about it is that this exact same transmitter can very nicely handle an MP5 HD multiplex. And of course, if you go down in service mode, you know, there, there's, there's room left over. So in the end, um, you will only require, you know, in the order of 1 15th of the transmitter infrastructure in order to broadcast a large multitude of audio streams. What if you already have a conversion today? Uh, let's assume you already have, uh, if, if, if you already have a GV today, um, assuming it's broadcasting hybrid IBOC today, um, you already have an exporter plus, you already have an importer plus, well, you'll need two more, of course. There is going to be an exciter update that has yet to be defined. Uh, but what is very nice with uh, the work we've done is that the existing um, power of the of the transmitter and all the, the amplifiers are capable of doing that today. And if you're broadcasting IBOC today, you will have the power overhead to, to go HD multiplex, no problem. Other savings, of course, are... So this could be the next step for your digital implementation? Exactly, exactly. Um, uh, of course, other savings are signal antenna. Uh, you only need one, so less tower space and rent, less cooling because we're dealing with one transmitter as opposed to a whole bunch of FMs or uh, hybrids, whatever. Uh, footprint, of course, content distribution, maintenance, all of those good things. Uh, but let's look at transmission power in the next step. Since uh, with some of the studies done in the, in the U.S., uh, it's been found that a, a typical hybrid, let's say FM plus MP3 station broadcasting today, the HD signal will have about the same coverage as the FM at 10% of the signal power, which then means we really only need 10% of the RMS power for an MP1 mode. Having three stations together, now we have, we're at three kilowatts compared to 10 kilowatts. Um, we do take a hit in efficiency because it's an all digital signal, but overall your FM was running at 13.9 kilowatts at 72% efficiency. We're only at 6.7 or eight, eight kilowatts, nine kilowatts, depending on the mode, but we're broadcasting a lot more audio streams. So even running one of those transmitters, let's say in hybrid uh, HD multiplex transmitter in MP5 mode over a course of a year would run you maybe this much in power, depending on your power rate, of course. But running a comparable network of 15 FM transmitters, well, there's a big, big difference here. So this is really the promise of, of digital transmission overall, is once we go to all digital, there's a lot of savings to be had. And this is a practical way of accomplishing that. The spectral efficiency, of course, is always a big thing with HD multiplex as well. Um, you know, band, band two is getting full in many places, big markets, certainly. There's no frequencies available. Uh, with this, let's say, you know, just for demonstration purposes only, illustration purposes, if we took the entire band and build it out with multiplex, and you, we, let's say we could use every half the band for that, uh, you know, you could have 255 audio streams. And this is done because of this tight spectral packing from a single transmitter. There's no self-interference on the stations from that transmitter because the relative signal levels will always stay fixed. And it is possible to short space uh, the HD multiplex transmitters because um, 
IBOC can operate with a desired to undesired ratio as little as 4 dB. And I've done that in a lab where I've injected noise at those levels. And with those IBOC carriers just peaking out of noise, you still get perfect audio. Um, it's quite amazing. Whereas FM, you need at least 20 to 30 dB. Uh, we can also show that we can have regional, regionalization support because of the small interference zones. You could reuse those same frequencies more easily and you can fill in those regions with SFN networks. Uh, as, as Chuck alluded to earlier, we don't always have 600 kilohertz available. Well, here's a potential solution. Well, we can simply turn off the outer sidebands. The forward error correction in the HD I box signal is strong enough that a receiver can run on a single sideband only. And we've demonstrated that at NAB. So we can turn off the outer sidebands, but what we should do then is give the inner side bands a little bit more power to make up for that, um, to compensate for the frequency diversity that we've now lost, and um, uh, we'll do that. So now we have a signal with the outer carrier speak at about minus 10 dBc that really doesn't look that much different from our typical hybrid FM plus I box signal. So spectral planning and whatnot should really not be all that different than for our common hybrid case today. In addition to all of that, I would recommend we switch the inner carriers to MP6 mode, the highest robustness level. And again, your signal will go so much further. Now we can play a little neat little trick here. If we switch the inner sidebands, now we're back to 200 kilohertz tuning. Um, because now I've drawn in sort of the non-existent sidebands here, which previously would have been sitting here. But now by switching those, we can actually move over. But one note to say here is that uh, you know one sideband operation only is still an experimental, it's a bit of a research project. Um, not all receivers handle that gracefully. Um, I've demonstrated a couple of receivers at NAB that did work quite well with that. Um, but there is certainly research active in this area to uh, come up with better service mode for this application. Here is just a snapshot of the, uh, the, the signal running through our transmitter, and we've also shown that in our demonstration. And of course, we can take the concept further and even uh, take out the last couple sidebands, run in 200 kilohertz only. Um, same concept again, we can squeeze it into smaller uh, spaces. So here we see a picture of the uh, demonstration we did at NAB. Uh, where we showed 15 looping audio streams that were pre-processed thanks to Omnia. And uh, it was a little VS transmitter running here. Uh, the beauty of it is the VS transmitter is just a stock transmitter. It was just an exciter change that we had to do. Um, and uh, it uh, worked quite nicely. And we've had a couple off the shelf receivers that would then receive the signal. Um, you might want to check out the uh, YouTube video with the uh, link that that's here that will show that shows you going through all those channels and uh, you can listen to the audio yeah we had 15 audio clips here you can see the, the different content we just tried to uh, come up with a large mix of different clips uh, we had three different frequencies 96 5 6 and 7 um, and we had five uh, secondaries or five uh, HD streams on each one of those the first one in all of those was set to be 32 kilobits full stereo uh, HD2, 3, and 4 always was 24 kilobits parametric stereo. And the last one was uh, 15 kilobits at mono. And overall, um, you know, the clip sounded very good, uh, but you can certainly uh, uh, listen to that yourself. So here is some of the, uh, just a couple of clips of that YouTube video. Um, we don't want to go through it here, but shows you here we're tuning into station A, and I've put in a call sign of int A just to show that it's a different station. Um, and we have five channels on here, one, two, three, four, five. And once you go up to the next channel, well, it has to reacquire, get the next sets of side bands here, and it's now showing station B, and channel six, seven, eight, nine, ten are on those. And I 6.7 in the end was station C, it's those sets of carriers here. We got the remaining stations 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And again, I just uh, encourage you to check out the YouTube video um, and uh, you'll, you'll see that for yourself. 
So one of the questions that comes up is that you know th th there's not a lot of extra bandwidth certainly around the world in the largest markets. So that's indicated by the top line, which is the number one market in the U.S. The the second line is is uh, market number 25, and th you see there's significant space there. Some of the, which could accommodate uh, HD multiplex. And as you go down into the 50, 75, and 100 markets, a lot more space is available, which could accommodate accommodate today HD multiplex, even in the 600 kilohertz version. And then going forward, we start to talk about the possible use cases. Now understand, Nautel isn't the expert in how to commercialize this. This is a concept car. We're throwing this open to the world to let you tell us what how this might be utilized. But these are some use cases that we've come up with. So worldwide, if I, if I could say in general, small market stations are, are increasingly financially challenged. For instance, a, a town of 30,000 people with maybe three or four FMs and one or two AMs, maybe none of them are making, making a lot of money. And these stations potentially could cooperate to create a single station in which all of their content is, is carried, all of the AMs and FMs in the market could be on there, and some additional channels, some additional expansion room owned by those existing stations so there's no new competition. The transmission operating costs of the station could be less than one of the stations alone. And the extra sites and the real estate associated with those sites could be sold and more than pay for the capital up, uh, up, uh, up, up costs of so changes in, in, in the capital expense to implement HD multiplex. So you could end up with a far better situation in a market. It would give the market a lot more content with much better quality and all of the stations would have one fifteenth or more or less of, of, their, of their operating costs uh, for the, from the transmission standpoint. Case number two is narrow casting. So if you look at the world globally, I mean, radio used to have all of the ears belong to radio, and, and there was a few number of radio stations, not the number we have today. Um, and, and each station played a little bit of everything. Kind of that's the concept of broadcasting, I suppose. But today, with so many content choices, radio needs the ability to compete with niche-focused content, like our listeners are used to hearing in satellite and the web. And what's needed is the ability for broadcaster to offer a wide range of formats in, in, on a full-time basis without increasing the number of competitors for the advertising revenue. So just because you've got a lot more content channels doesn't mean that there's going to be an increase in the overall advertising revenue. So this accommodates both of those situations. For an example, foreign language content is very expensive to operate using traditional methods. That is, having your own FM stations to broadcast Korean, for instance. But this technology changes everything because now I could put 15 different content channels on a single station for the cost of operating a single station or less than that. Use case number three, with the digitalization of television, some space is being freed up in band one, especially from 76 to 88 megahertz. And there are efforts underway in some countries to reallocate this band for relocated AM content. If radio was able to utilize this band with using HD multiplex, it could be planned intelligently and to be used to offer far more content than is available today. And in fact, single frequency networks could be used to offer content at extremely cost-effective way and to provide wide geographic coverage for a broad range of high quality content. And we'll actually go into SFNs a little bit and explain why this works so well. Before you move on there, Chuck. Yep, yep mentioned there as well is that there is a lot of receivers that are able to tune into the top end of this uh, 76 to 88 megahertz band already with many right. receivers going down to 87.5 so it is certainly possible to place multicast at the high end of that and already have a large subset of subset of receivers able to receive it and that's one of the keys in in the digital radio business is making sure that the receivers are available to deal with this technology that's right. So another case is interactivity. Um, you have enough content channels, potentially, that you could actually make radio interactive. People could request songs online and be played out directly on an HD multiplex stream, making all kinds of uh, revolutions in the way that radio interrate, interrelates with the listener. Um, and the entire HD multiplex could be branded as one. Um, the pr playlist could be crowdsourced, and the low operating cost of HD multiplex makes this possible. So for 
instance, a station with a 100,000 weekly reach could be dealt with with 10 streams of 100,000 listeners per stream. So the, the, the functionality of this works. And it, it, I think that the, the creativity that radio has always utilized has yet to, to see how this type of technology could make radio even more effective. Now let's talk about SFNs. Phil, you want to explain this interesting chart? Right. I, I just grabbed this one from a previous uh, presentation we've done on SFNs. And the beauty of HD Multiplex, now that we're all digital, SFNs really become practical. So this example here shows uh, two transmitters, a main and a booster, but it could also be two of equal power, whatnot. Um, and let's say it emits a signal and the booster sends a signal 60 microseconds delayed, you'll see that the signals intersect at these lines, at these equal delay lines. So what if you're 50 kilometers apart, it takes about 167 microseconds to fly from one end to the other. Uh, but IBOC has a 75 microsecond guard interval, which means that actually a large portion of this geography we're already covered. No matter what the relative signal levels are from main and booster, if they're time aligned, it doesn't matter. There will be a smooth handoff, somebody driving from main to booster, and at some point, the radio will simply use the booster signal. Um, so we can certainly, we've demonstrated that a couple of years ago that we can essentially hand off uh, a receiver from one to the next. Uh, we've, here's also just a slide without going into too much detail that we've done a fair bit of research in SFN operation of IBOC. And uh, you can see that uh, with a 40 microsecond uh, offset between two signals, no matter what their relative levels are, you're always within the reception limit. So you can do a smooth handoff. And up to 75 microseconds, that's getting towards the edge. But even if you have a complete... And Phil, I think the thing that's important here is to mention the fact that if you compare this to analog, uh, the advantage of doing SFNs in digital with HD Multiplex is that the figure of merit where you can start hearing it in analog, the errors, is at one microsecond any in an error and in within a tenth of a dB. And you can see the the when you do it with HD Multiplex, because of the way OFDM works and whatnot, you end up with a much broader acceptability and it, it just is fixed automatically in HD Multiplex. Right, exactly. And not only the time difference, one microsecond to 75, HD only requires a 4 dB desired undesired. You can see that in the black curve here. With 4 dB desired undesired, um, you you know, if, if you have a greater ratio than that, you still have good reception. The same figure of merit for FM will be 20 to 30 dB, and you will have noise impact. So our interference zones have shrunk in size, and our time budget has increased by an order of magnitude. So now that makes SFNs happen. Okay, and I guess the other thing to think about is that what we've identified are some very specific opportunities um, that are examples of what might work and we've, we've considered, but every place in the world is different and, and every regulatory band plan is different. And so we're not experts in your situation and we're just trying to present some technological tools that may be able to be tailored for your case. So just contact your Nautel representative to discuss how Nautel's innovative digital radio tools might work in your situation. And and again, I have to underline, the thing that's really cool about all this is that HD Multiplex works with the vast majority of HD radios that are already in the marketplace, of millions and millions of radios that are already in the marketplace today. Let, that's the magic. Let me also interject that HD Multiplex is very, very flexible for your situation. We've always shown a 600 kilohertz mode, a 400 kilohertz mode, 200 kilohertz mode. It can work with FMs in the band. It can work with hybrid and hybrids in the band. It's a very, very flexible situation that can be tailored to a number of use cases. Yep. All right. So um, I guess the next step is what would I do if I wanted to try this? Well, in the United States, for example, there's a white space database uh, which allows you to utilize the white space in the broadcast television spectrum. Um, and they're very open to creativity and innovation. And uh, you could certainly apply for an experimental license, for instance, for Channel 6. Or you could use a special temporary authority to test the system on your frequency. Um, 
and you can test both the technical feasibility and then trial new business uh, models. Many receivers for European are, uh, tuning are available that will do the 100 kilohertz steps and the range of the Nautel transmitters today will handle 87.5 to 108 as standard. So that's our webinar for today. That's the basics of, of what we wanted to talk about. I see a number of, of questions here. Um, it says one of them is what will be the requirement for stations that have repeating transmitter sites? So um, I, I think if it's on the same frequency, I think you've explained that, Phil, for SFMs. Uh, but if it's on a different frequency, there's really no uh, issue. Uh, there's another gentleman who has asked um, uh, that they uh, will, will the slides for this webinar be available after the webinar, and the answer is yes. Um, probably within a day or so, we will have this webinar up on our webinars page on our website, and you'll be able to watch the entire webinar uh, in, uh, in, uh, in 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 completely from the beginning uh, at any time you want. It'll be up there for years, I suspect. That's the way we've typically done it. So. Uh, let me see here, put that back. So we have a number of different ways you can get more information from us. The Nautel Waves newsletter at that uh, uh, address. Uh, our webinars are available from our webinars page, nautel.com forward slash webinars. We have a YouTube page and an easy way to find that one video that Phil was talking about, the NAB video where we showed the HD multiplex in operation. Just go to our YouTube page and go log into our web page, which is Nautel Limited. Uh, on YouTube and you'll be able to find the HD multiplex one. And then of course the Nautel store has about 70,000 spare parts and things like that you can buy online. And of course we stand ready to help you at any time. And uh, you can contact any of us through the email sales at Nautel.com. So uh, Phil, thank you very much for being a part of this. It's been fun. I don't think we've barely scratched the surface of what's possible. Oh no, there's more to come but we'll have fun with it. And thank you for sticking with us today and being a part of our webinar. For Phil Schmidt, I'm Chuck Kelly. Have a good day, and thanks for being with us. Bye-bye.